we, uh, on Wednesday, I was asking the group that was here, they had to tell me what to preach on today because uh, knowing Thanksgiving was coming up uh, for a long time, I kept thinking to myself based on our studies about God and, and uh, not, not only his attributes, but his character and his nature, uh, I had a great desire to, uh, to, to talk about Thanksgiving and knowing Thanksgiving was coming up, uh, uh, it, was a, it was only a question of is it this week or is it next week? Because either you speak, you know, the week of Thanksgiving, Sunday's the beginning of the, the next week, and it'll already be after Thanksgiving, but it'll be that Thanksgiving weekend. So they told me the bulletin said this was Thanksgiving weekend, so, uh, or week, so I'm preaching a Thanksgiving message today. And I do so in, in almost like one of the prophets that said he's jealous for, for the Lord. And uh, I realize that, uh, that I'm probably speaking to the choir in the sense that if anybody is thankful, it's certainly those of you that are here today uh, and your presence is, shows part of that thanksgiving. Um, but, uh, but as well, you get thinking about those that just take God for granted and uh, his gift of grace and salvation for granted. And I mean, how do you take the creator of the universe for granted and yet they, the world does? And the more you think about it, not only do you remind yourself how grateful we ought to be, uh, but then you, you, you get jealous for God. Like, where, where is the thanksgiving that he deserves? And uh, so, anyhow, with that thought in mind, there's some things that, in light of uh, the character of God and all the things we studied in the past year, uh, if anybody ought to be given thanks, it ought to be us. But there's some things that I want to share with you, uh, a, a little bit informative at the beginning, and then uh, the very meat of the matter will follow that. Luke chapter 17 and verse 11, you're probably familiar with this. It says, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of, of Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were leprous, which stood afar off. And they, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there, were, were there not ten, lep, uh, ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that re, re, return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise and go, uh, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that we might give a good thought to what it means to be thankful and Lord, among all things, I pray our hearts would be filled with thanksgiving today and every day of our life for your grace and your love, your goodness to us, and the blessed hope that lies ahead that's for all eternity. That's all through our Savior and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Certainly the, the story about the ten lepers and, and only one turns back and gives thanks is a, is a real statement about thanksgiving. Uh, in the passage itself, you, we could spend a lot of time. Ten is a number where God puts Israel through a, a complete cycle of trials. This is certainly uh, has a rebuke to the nation of Israel in which he goes through Samaria, Galilee. It doesn't say what city he's in. But when he comes into the city, there's ten lepers there and, uh, and they want to be healed. They're standing afar off. They're unclean. And he just simply says, go show yourself to the priest. Well, that's what a leper need to do, that if they had leprosy, a priest declares them a leopard and separates them from the, the group. They're unclean. And, and then if by chance their leprosy goes away, they have to go to the priest and he has to examine them and give, offer a sacrifice and, and then acknowledge that they are indeed clean. So before they're even cleansed, the Lord says, go show yourself to the priest. And they start going and as they're going, they're healed. They're, the leprosy is gone. Nine just keep going. Hopefully they're going to a priest. And you can see the rebuke to the nation of Israel that the priesthood have, who has not recognized Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they're going to have to look at ten leopards and say, yeah, all ten of you are clean. How is that possible? And the leprosy was a deadly disease. 
And those priests are going to have to acknowledge that Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah of Israel, uh, had indeed healed them. So it's really a, a testimony or a, a sentence or a, a test to the priests in Israel. But the nine go on, one turns back, gives glory to God, and, and, and falls to the feet of Jesus Christ in thanksgiving. And the Lord says, wasn't there ten? Where are the nine? Only one was thankful. And then it says, he was a Samaritan. Ooh, <laughs> the Jews don't like the Samaritans, they're half-breeds. And yet that was the Samaritan who recognized Jesus Christ and, and stopped to give thanks. But you know the amazing part of all of that, I never saw this before, but that last verse in there, it said, the, after the, the knowledge that you know, the nine didn't come back and all, he says to the one that turned to him in 19, he says, And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. You know, if you think about that, that means those other nine, they might be cleansed, they're not whole. This man's faith has made him whole. You can be cleansed of leprosy. You can have a physical being taken care of. For Israel to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, put them in that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's more than just the physical involved here. This man is made whole in his recognition and appreciation of the gift that Jesus Christ just gave to him. And for us, it's not a physical healing that we're looking for to give thanks. There's a spiritual healing that came to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though he died for everyone, only those who acknowledge that he is their Savior, the one who indeed paid for their sins and trust him as their Savior. This man, there, there's a relationship that he gave glory to God. So this thanksgiving is associated with giving glory to God, is it not? And then the Lord says, your faith has made you whole. So giving glory to God is associated with thanksgiving, which is associated with faith. And really in grace you realize that, that how closely thanks and faith are related in that in grace, grace is God has already provided everything through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already completely died and completely paid for all your sins. There's nothing you can do to save yourself except to acknowledge the fact that you believe that Jesus Christ did die on the cross for your sins. Trust Him in faith. And what else can you do but say thank you? That's, that's all you can do in grace. So there's that association uh, with faith and, and, and uh, glory and... and uh, and grace all wrapped up in, those, in that lesson. Now that's not the major part of the lesson. That's certainly getting, getting our minds to thinking about thanksgiving and, uh, and certainly all thanksgiving belonging to God. But in, in preparation, uh, you know, you start out doing one thing and one thing leads to another. And I, I, you could, I could actually give a little mini series on thanksgiving because what I did is, is I knew, I just knew that if I looked up the word thanksgiving or something, in fact, let me tell you the words. There's seven different varieties of this I looked up. I looked up the word thank, thanks, thanked, thanking, thankful, thanksgiving, and thanksgivings. So all those different forms. I, I looked up and just looked at them. But the reason I looked them all up in the first place is I had a feeling, and I knew it would be true, that I was going to find more of that in Paul's epistles than anywhere else. And I knew that because of Paul's epistles are where you magnify the grace of God and what we just got done saying. Where else, what else could you do when you learn about the grace of God that everything is freely given to you and because of the work of Christ? Uh, you can't do anything else but be thankful and, and give God thanks and glory in that thanks. So I knew I was going to find it used there, so I just looked it up so I could throw out some numbers. But then that started intriguing me and I couldn't stop. <laughs> Let me give you some information that, that uh, just can kind of condense it down. The Old Testament, and I'm, by that I'm talking about Genesis to Malachi, those seven terms of, being, of thanksgiving is used 64 times. By the way, it's 132 times in the whole Bible. 64 times in the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, and, and, and in, in, those, in those times, I was amazed that the very first time it's used, and it's used Thanksgiving is the first time it's used in all those forms, is in Leviticus chapter 7, where Israel is offered an opportunity to give a Thanksgiving offering to God. Do you realize Leviticus 7 is 2,500 years into human history? And, and the word thanksgiving or thanks 
hasn't been used in your Bible all the way. I, I don't think that, I don't mean there's an absence of people in gratitude, but that word didn't appear until Leviticus chapter 7, where God offers to Israel that you can bring an offering. But there's something about that offering. It's, it's first said in Leviticus 7, but come to Leviticus chapter 22. Because in all of this, I kept thinking to myself, what's the right way to express the meaning of thanksgiving? And we'll get it out of the scriptures here. After Leviticus 7, the next time is Leviticus 22. And just verse 29. Leviticus 22 verse 29 says, And when ye offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord, offer ye it at your own will. Part of the reason for me even talking about thanksgiving is because the things that I've been expressing about God and his character, his nature, but that blended into God's dealings with mankind, free will is an extremely important doctrine in your Bible. Not just something I desire to believe in and I'm mad about people who don't believe in it, but it's a real important thing. We already talked about that being a, a basis of a relationship. Anything that's forced, there's no relationship there. But free will is an important part of the character of God in his relationship to man and giving man. Here, you can't give a thanksgiving offering to God unless you do it out of your own will. That would be like, you know, when we have our kids, we train them and say thank you. And sometimes a little kid gets a little stubborn, we whack him one. No, no. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Not afraid to say it. We give him a little encouragement <laughs> to say thank you. And, uh, uh, and, and we have to force it. Well, when you force it, they really don't mean it. But you're going to teach them to mean it later, hopefully. But, but the point is, is, is thankfulness cannot be forced. Because if you can force someone to say thank you, but that's just words. Thankfulness is more than words. And, and so it can't be something that's forced. So God, when he gives Israel that opportunity to offer a thanksgiving offering, he said it has to be done at your own will. It can't be forced. Otherwise, it's not thanksgiving at all to God. So that, that's an interesting thing. There's only one other thing in the Old Testament. Come to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And certainly David. <laughs> this all centers around him. He's a very thankful man. He's a man after God's own heart. But he understands some things about being thankful to God. He understands some things about God and his goodness and, and uh, his mercy and his grace. And Anyhow, the, David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and so in chapter 16, verse 1, it says, of 1 Chronicles, So they brought the Ark of the God and set it in the midst of the tent, that David had pitched for it, and they brought burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So they're, they're bringing in the, the, uh, the, covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in, in verse 4, he appointed certain Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord, and to record and to give thanks and praise to the Lord God of Israel. So they're going to make a record of this, but uh, there's this thanks and praise that they're also going to record there as they're honoring God. And so down in verse 7 it says, Then on that day David delivered the first of the Psalms to thank the Lord into the hands of Asaph, his, his, uh, his brethren, to give thanks unto the Lord, to uh, uh, call, upon, uh, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto the Lord, sing psalms unto the Lord, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in, the, uh, in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and, and, and his strength, seek his face continually, remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. So just taking that, when he, David writes a psalm of thanksgiving, delivers it to Asaph, who's going to lead the, the, the singers in praise, and, and part of that singing and praising God is, it is a thanksgiving praise to God, and it's talking about all that God has done, all his wonders, that verse 12, remembering his marvelous works. So all those things as you're thinking about God and what he has said, what he has done, all his marvelous works, and, and not just saying it, but having it come right out of your heart. That's where thanksgiving has to come from. 
so that you realize by the time that you come to the end of the Old Testament that you learn that thanksgiving must be freely given, come freely given from the heart and is really part of your worship toward God. Everyone wants to talk about worship, don't they? So they emphasize the singing. But the, the real part of the worship is responding back to God, the acknowledgement of His goodness, His grace, His mercy, His character. And you know, when it says singing that, part of my jealousy is wondering, you know, believers who know Jesus Christ as their Savior, you ask them if they're saved, yeah, I know, He died on the cross for my sins. That's all they know, that's all they care to know. That's enough, God will save them. You know, by the way, my jealousy for God, that it might be on my part, but He don't have it on His part. It's not like God in heaven is saying, oh, they don't respect me enough, they don't love me enough. No, he just given, he just showing his goodness to man, giving you an opportunity to appreciate it. And those who don't appreciate it, not going to hurt him. He's, he's sufficient in himself. He, he's not hurt. I'm hurt over it. Because you get people, yeah, I'm saved. They could care less about God other than receive his salvation. You know, when you see singing psalms here, part of your presence, and we call this a worship service, you don't, practice it like what other people call worship uh, because we practice spirit worship in spirit and in truth so we study and realize there's a reason behind our worship of God so taking in some understanding but that singing part you know there, if you stayed home today and I don't mean to pick on the people streaming in the video <laughs> but if you stayed at home today and, uh, and read your Bible and say I don't have to go to church I can read my Bible well praise the Lord you can do that did you do any singing where would you even learn the songs to sing? That is part, to, to take that, that, that truth because a song becomes a melody in the heart that you sing together here, but certainly I know that you, when you leave here that in the middle of the week a song pops up in your mind and you start singing it. Now if you're listening to rock music on the radio, that's probably what you're singing. But, but if you take Jim's advice and listen to gospel music, now, that's what's going to pop up and that's what you're going to sing, but that's part of that appreciation to the Lord. So anyhow, my point is, is that, that thanksgiving is something that's free will coming from the heart is, is really worship toward God. So you learn that in the Old Testament. Now let's move quickly here. Uh, when you get into the New Testament, and here what I'm going to take is Matthew through Acts, but I'm going to tell you right now that the two times it's found in the book of Acts are both about the Apostle Paul, chapter 27 and chapter 28. Paul's ministry. So that's, that's kind of unique. But, but anyhow, from Matthew to Acts, because those weren't written by the Apostle Paul, that in that time, there's 20 times that word is found. The, 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 all the different forms of thanks, thanksgiving, is found. All but two times that came out of the Lord's mouth. 18 of those times, actually there are only Matthew through John, there's only 18 times, so the 16 of those times, the Lord himself was speaking. There's only two other times. One is Anna, the widow, at the birth of Jesus Christ, who thanked God about the birth of Christ and went out and told everybody to look for redemption in Israel. The other one is that Samaritan we just read about in Luke chapter 17 there. Every other time you read about Thanksgiving, it's the Lord teaching people to be thankful or He Himself giving thanks to God the Father. Now I thought, boy, that's interesting because there's a lot lack of Israel and all their blessings of giving thanks to God. And just obvious by the usage of that word. Another part of that interesting fact there is that eight of the 18 times, the, or the 16 times that the Lord used the word, eight times it's centered around the Lord giving thanks for food. You know, we're going to have a Thanksgiving meal, and we give thanks for that meal. But I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the lack of Thanksgiving all year long at meal time. I think that's the most fundamental, the most basic thanksgiving to God is in a home that before they eat they acknowledge God's goodness and just thanking Him for food. That, that's, that you learn that from the Bible when you read it. And, uh, and like I say, out of the 16 times, half the time the Lord was eating food or getting ready to break bread and, and He stopped and prayed. So it would tell you the importance of acknowledging God in, in those areas of life. Now that takes us to Paul's epistles. Uh, Paul's epistles, it's found 44 times, 
you have to add those two times in Acts if you want to attribute those to the Apostle Paul. But in Paul's epistles, the Apostle Paul will use those terms 44 times, and I knew that would be the case. More, almost, almost all, uh, it's interesting, there's 20 times before Paul and, and, uh, and 44 in Paul's epistles. That's the total amount of the Old Testament equals. So when you get after Paul's epistles, let me just tell you that right now, Hebrews to Revelation, there's only one time in Hebrews where it talks about where the writer of Hebrews is telling the Jews to offer God the sacrifice of praise of thanksgiving. So he's encouraging the Jews to be thankful, just like the Lord was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And other than that, the ones that are giving thanks, there's three times in the book of Revelation, they're the angelic beings during the wrath that's being poured out on the earth. They're thanking God for what he is accomplishing in the earth and purifying the earth and making it ready for Jesus Christ's kingdom to come. But So then most of that New Testament is the Apostle Paul giving thanks, and he's the, he's the apostle that God revealed grace to, and that's why I would have expected that in the first, time, the first place. Um, I'm going I'm to break down Paul's in a minute, but going back to the idea about us teaching our children to say thank you. You know, one of the reasons that we have to teach our children to say thank you is because in their immaturity, someone gives them a gift. And two things happen. One, even if they have a grateful heart, what, what am I supposed to do? It's kind of like, and, and so you encourage them to say, say thank you. Oh, okay, that's what I can do, say thank you. But the other is, is because children and because we're stingy, because we have an old nature, someone hands you a gift and all you can think of is me and my gift. <laughs> totally not acknowledging the gift and especially the giver, the generosity of the giver. So we encourage our children to say thanks so that they at least know how to express themselves or to get them off their self-centered so that to teach them to acknowledge, not just to take the gift, but to acknowledge the gift and the giver of the gift itself. So looking at Paul's epistles and thinking exactly how, how, what is exactly Thanksgiving? Uh, I looked at Paul and I realized I, I took all those 44 things, I looked at every verse and I actually assigned him a category. that <laughs> You can do it different ways. But anyhow, I, I want to just give you an idea of some of the categories. Turn to Romans chapter 16. And we're not even to our message yet. Nineteen of those 44 times, but also that Acts 28 and verse 15, so that would be 20 total by Paul, but in his epistles, 19 times, when he speaks about thanks or thanksgiving, it's an overwhelming expression of, of gratefulness for people or an event. And, uh, and, 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 and to God, but, but the idea there is an, is an overwhelming expression of gratefulness. Uh, it, it, one way to show that uh, is in, in this, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 3, it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who for their own life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, in case you don't understand who the Apostle Paul is, if you didn't, you wouldn't understand that last expression. You would understand that Aquila and Priscilla, they did something that they, their life was on the line for the Apostle Paul. And so he says, unto whom I give thanks. Well, of course, he gives thanks. He's grateful that they would jeopardize their life for him. But he says, not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Well, why would all the churches of the Gentiles be given thanks that they lay down their life for Paul? Because Paul's the messenger of grace. God revealed to him the mystery of the age of grace, our doctrine for today. And by them laying down their life and preserving Paul's life, we have Paul's epistles in our Bible to study the exceeding grace of God toward us. And uh, so there's an expression there that he's not just grateful for his own life, but all the Gentiles are grateful for what he did, for what they did, because of who Paul is to us. And, and he is the apostle of the Gentiles and the apostle of God's grace for us and explains all that God has given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyhow, you see that that's 19 times Paul goes over grace that way. Come over to chapter 14 of Romans. 
look at this verse closely. Verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be pro fully persuaded in his own mind. Seventh-day Adventists have no idea what Paul's talking about here, <laughs> because apparently we're not under the Sabbath. <laughs> The age of grace, we're not under the law. The Sabbath was the sign of the covenant of law that God gave to Israel. We're not Israel. We're not under the law. It has nothing to do with us in the age of grace. So Paul teaching people said, look, one day is like another. One day is all the same. But let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Let him grow to understand how free you are in grace. He goes on. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. You know, here's a guy, whether he eats or not, giving God thanks. But you know what, here again, when I look through Paul's epistles, five times when he talks about giving thanks, it's directly associated to eating. That passage in, in Acts chapter 27, Paul's on a shipwreck, They're ready to, the ship is ready to bust apart. He finally persuades all the heathen, look, God's going to spare your life because of me, and we're going to crash, and you're going to need some strength, so let's sit down and eat. And he made them sit down, and before all them heathen, he gave thanks to God. Again, Paul, you know, when you read this verse, it doesn't ever say that you don't give thanks. The very essence of eating a meal is stopping and saying thank you to the Lord for the provision and uh, it's so it's just very basic and I, I say that as a, as a way of if Israel was not thankful like they ought to have been make sure that's not happening in your life to you personally make sure that you acknowledge God in the most that's that's the most elementary way uh, is to give thanks before eating eight times in Paul's epistles uh, come to Ephesians chapter 5 they are directly an expression of spirituality. The idea of not giving thanks is carnal. Spirituality produces, or will, the fruit of spirituality will produce thanksgiving. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 18, this is where we're challenged about being filled with the Spirit, and that's certainly what spiritual is all about, being under the control and the influence of God's Holy Spirit, which, by the way, comes by you being in God's Word and letting uh, the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, as it says in Colossians. But if Rome, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 18 says, be, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. See the Trinity in that? You, down here on earth, being filled with God's Spirit, turns around and gives thanks always uh, in, uh, for all things unto God the Father, and you do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that you, you see the Trinity involved there and that being the fruit of spirituality in your life. Eight times in Paul's epistles it's directly relating to a spiritual condition. Sixteen times in Paul's epistles it's a reference to the very grace of God itself. Second um, Corinthians chapter 9 We've showed all the others, and I'll show this one as well. Paul's taking up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. Oh, this is not the one I wanted. Verse 11 says, Being enriched in all things to all bountifulness, which causes us thanksgiving to God, for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, 
but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, while by the experiment of this ministration they, that is Israel, glorify God for his professed subjection, for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them, and by their prayers for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. <laughs> Paul's taking a collection. Gentiles who got saved are sending a contribution to the Jews who didn't get their kingdom, the believing remnant of Israel who now are, are waiting for the future of their kingdom, but they get, receive a contribution from the Gentiles. They thank God for the grace of God in the Gentiles and pray for the Gentiles. And, and there's just this abundance of grace that's going on because, as he says there, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. God's gift is beyond anything we can say, so what do we say? Thank you, Lord. But you can see how it's there, it's directly related to the dispensation of the grace of God to the Gentiles. And Paul, 16 times when he talks about thanksgiving, it's in that respect. Now come to me, here's where my, my concern is and even where I get a definition. Romans chapter 1. Now Paul is actually going back to how the Gentiles fell in the first place. Why God turned to Abraham and then made these promises to the nation of Israel and through the prophetic program the Gentiles would once again be blessed through the nation of Israel. The dispensation of grace is that Israel failed and rather than God bringing wrath and judgment to the world to bring them to repentance, to bring them their promise so that the Gentiles could come into salvation he interrupted his dealings with them and because of the cross of Christ sends out a message of grace to all nations. That includes lost Jews as well as Gentiles. So that we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. But Paul going back to explain where the Gentiles fell and how Israel fell and then goes on in Romans to talk about this grace unto us Gentiles goes back to a time in which God was dealing with the Gentiles and it says in verse 19 because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Romans 1.19 for, the, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We always worry about people when you never heard the gospel. The very, the very fact that there's a creation that stands in front of them, th that creation clearly teaches them about God's existence, God's eternal power and God's Godhead. That is God being in control of all things and, and, and everything centered around what he has determined and what he is bringing about. And even in that Godhead is a, is a reference to the Trinity itself. But, but those things are clearly seen in creation leaving them without excuse. Because they have this knowledge that there is a God but what, is, what did man do with that knowledge? Verse 21. Because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they, wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. Their, when the Gentiles knew God, and it was very evident that God existed, it says there, when they knew God, they did two things. And those two things are really one and the same. It says, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. To glorify him not as God means they're not going to acknowledge his greatness, his Godhead, him as creator. They're not going to acknowledge his creation of the universe, his creation of them. And if they don't acknowledge, is there anything to give thanks for? There's no one to give thanks to. So neither were they thankful. So when I looked at that and I saw how that related, it relates over there as, as our beginning, I, I started asking myself, what exactly then does it mean to be thankful? And, and you realize it's important to God. But, but uh, there's a sense in which you think, well, thankfulness is an emotion. Nah, that doesn't cut it. Because it, it, there is emotion to it, but it's more than an emotion in the fact that it is an acknowledgement. 
But, but it's more than an acknowledgement of gratitude. There's an acknowledgement of the person himself. They didn't glorify God as God. Neither were thankful. So there's, there's not just a, an emotion of or acknowledgement of gratitude that, of God and his greatness, but of God, first of all, of God being God. Acknowledgement of him. By the way, he keep giving them up. Verse 28, it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I'm tired even thinking about whether there is a God. That, that's, how, that's the case the Gentiles got in. So th- thankfulness is an acknowledgement of the person, but then not just of the person, but of the person's greatness or significance. That's what they're overlooking. Then, then a little bit more when you look into that, the person's character, the goodness, the goodness of that person toward you, and the action of that being, or here in this case God, toward man. His effort, his work, that becomes a gift to your benefit. None of that is being acknowledged by the Gentiles. Let me kind of put that in a way that, that you could probably understand that maybe moms would appreciate this Thursday. When I pray, sometimes when I pray and give thanks at a meal, I'll also thank the Lord for the hands that prepared it. I probably learned that from my dad, but I, but I know it in a way of appreciation. Because what I'm referring there is generally, in, in our family, it's Sancha, but usually that's the mother. But I don't, it might be a father in some cases. But why do I say that? Because... When you, when, you say, when you give thanks for the person who prepared your meal, you're first acknowledging the person. Now, I'm going to use the mother here. You're, to give thanks for the meal to the, in the human aspect, you're thanking the mother. You're actually acknowledging her. You know, you think of how meals go. Sit down and eat and run off. You didn't even stop and think about the person who prepared it. But when you think about the person, what are you thinking about? Well, one of the things is the ability. You take this raw hunk of meat that you couldn't chew up if you wanted to because it's raw and would have no taste whatsoever if it wasn't seasoned and baked for a long time and then garnished with all kinds of potatoes and vegetables and other things. And then, so so the ability of this person to actually make this meal, it's so good. (laughs) So you're you're acknowledging the person, but also the ability of that person to, to prepare that meal, but also the generous character. Two, four hours before you ate, this person started putting all this together. Working, working, uh, and sacrificing their own time and certainly their own energy on your behalf. And then puts it all together, puts it on the table right in front of you. Puts it there for your need, your nourishment, but really most of all for our enjoyment. I mean, we, need a, we don't need all that we get and don't need as well prepared as what we get. And what happens? All of that laid out in front of you freely. Giving thanks is acknowledging all those aspects. And that's why sometimes when you sit down, like kids, they just gobble it up. Husband, maybe, gobble it up. Go read the newspaper, watch TV. Kids go out and play, whatever it is. And no one, leave a mom there with the dishes afterwards. (laughs) But no one ever stopping acknowledging thank you. And when you say thank you, you're acknowledging all of that, the kindness, the generosity of the work. Think about it in God's behalf. Here, when you read this passage of scripture, I relate it to chapter 14 but you could, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, Acts, where the apostle Paul says that in the time that the Gentiles were cut off, God continued to show his goodness to, toward them and giving them rain in due season, uh, filling their hearts with food and gladness. They had the seasons and all. When you think about the Gentiles here, when the fact that they didn't, they, they didn't glorify God as God, neither were thankful that what, there were, what was happening is there was no acknowledgement of God at all, the thought, not even the thought of God. No praise, no glory to God, him just totally taken out of the picture. They're just living life. There's no recognition of his greatness. If you're not going to recognize him, if you recognize him, then you stop and think about it and say, whoa, wait a minute, what a world we live in. There's seasons, there's sunshine, there's air, there's food. There's, I mean, one, if you're going to acknowledge him, then, you've got to, then you start thinking about how great he is. And you start thinking about his greatness. But they were not acknowledging God and they weren't thankful. They were given no recognition of his greatness, the creation. They're breathing his air and not acknowledging him. 
They're loving it, even on a cold day like today, that sun comes out, and oh, Lord, thank you for the sun, but no Lord in that. No one to thank. They sit down and eat a meal, and their hearts are filled with joy and gladness. Not only are they, you know, when you fill your stomach, you feel good. And there's joy in your heart, but not, nothing, nothing acknowledged toward God. No acknowledgement whatsoever. That, that was the condition of the Gentiles. I'm worried about our society. That's the con- we might be practicing thanksgiving. There is no thanksgiving unless they know who to give thanks to. And there's only one person to give thanks to, God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but they got to this point. There's no consciousness of the character of God. All that we've been studying about his goodness, of his thoughts toward man. Now, I don't have time to take you to a bunch of verses I've looked up, but there's four times, well actually six times, but four times I want to talk to you about where the Bible says, what is man? We talk about the greatness of God. God is great, the creator of the universe. What is man? Job 7 verse 17 says, What is man that thou should magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him? God in his greatness concerned down here with us. Wow. <laughs> Job 15, 14. What is man that, that, that he should be clean? He that, which is born, he that which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. <laughs> Job didn't even know how that was going to happen. We knew through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be found righteous in God's sight. Job says, how can a man be just before God? But Job knew somehow God was going to provide that. What is man that God would do that? Psalms 8, 4, David asked the question, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou didst visit him? Psalms 40, verse 5 talks about, God consider his wondrous thoughts toward men that they can't be numbered. Wow. We've, when we study the greatness of God, he knows how many hairs are on your head. Why would God con- be that concerned about you? In all of his greatness, he has all these thoughts toward you. And a person doesn't even say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Won't even think about God, and he's got all them thoughts toward them. Just amazing. Psalms 144 verse 3 it says, Lord what is man that thou takest knowledge of him or the son of man that thou should account of him. So, so when they're not giving thanks to God they're, they're, not be, they're not conscious of his character and what I mean by that his goodness his very thoughts toward man. There is no appreciation of his self imposed imposition. I don't know if that's the right term But do you realize that when God, here's God, creator of the universe, creator of all things, and then he makes a promise to man. Made promises to Israel, but right from the beginning when man sinned, God made a promise that a seed of a woman was going to take care of the seed of serpent and bring salvation to this world. God had to, was, what's the word? (laughs) He imposed something upon himself that now he has to do. Once he speaks it, he's got to do it, doesn't he? Because he can't lie. He didn't have to do nothing for man. But every time he promises man something, it cost him. It don't cost us. And he obligates himself. Why would he obligate himself to little peons? But he does. The worst part about it is man goes through life and never even acknowledges God's greatness and, and the very fact that God would impose things upon himself for their behalf. No regards, and this has got to be the greatest of them all, of the sacrifice that God and His Son made when Jesus Christ came into this world and went to the cross and on the cross God who knew no sin God laid the iniquity of us all on the Lord Jesus Christ and He died on that cross to pay for our sins our sins were laid on Him He cried my God my God why hast thou forsaken me the sins of the world were laid on Jesus Christ and he justly paid the penalty of our sins before God the Father so that God the Father could freely give us eternal life as a gift. We're the sinner and he provides the salvation and he fully completely paid for all of our sins and man goes around and does not acknowledge even the religious man will only partially acknowledge yeah Christ died on the cross for my sins but I repented I got water baptized I confess my sins and on and on and on of what they did and just make Jesus Christ a part of paying for sin. Well that's not trusting him as your savior. 
So man doesn't even, even religious men don't totally acknowledge what Jesus Christ did in dying on the cross for our, our sins to the fact that he totally finished the work. Our needs are all met. An eternal benefit is given to us freely in Christ. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's no boasting. It's just receiving what Jesus Christ did. And you receive it on the basis of faith. And other than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, what else can you say? Just thank you. And with, with that comes joy unspeakable and full of glory. Huh? Saved. Eternal life. Part of God's eternal purpose. Freely given to us in Christ. That's why in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Don't be an ignorant, ungrateful, self-centered, greedy heathen. Live in a conscious acknowledgement of God's greatness, of God's goodness toward you, of his grace, his life uh, that he's given you in Christ, and live in that state of praise, acceptance, and thanksgiving. All to the glory of God. Be ye thankful. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do give thanks to you for all the different things that thanksgiving is. Acknowledging more than just your existence, but your grace, great, greatness, but also your goodness toward us how you impose upon yourself that we might be blessed, how you sent your Son to become the sacrifice for our sins that we might be saved, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, you give us the gift of eternal life that brings salvation to its completeness when we trust your Son as our Savior. And Father, we realize and acknowledge how blessed we are in Christ and even in the age in which you're not manifesting your physical blessings to us, how blessed we are. Just living in the creation that you've created, giving us the health that we have, to have the food and, and gladness in our heart in the physical sense as well. Father, I pray that every one of us don't go one day without the acknowledgement of your goodness and your grace toward us. Living in the appreciation of it and demonstrating it and a song in our heart, speaking to you before other people, about you before to other people, and always acknowledging gratefulness verbally in our hearts unto you. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of eternal life, for your Son, and for all you've given us in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.